Hello everyone, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you so much for coming out today to Darien Library. My name is Erin Shea, I'm the head of adult programming here. I would just like to briefly, oh, I would just like to briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make events like these available to the community. I would also like to thank the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. They were instrumental in uh, today, today's events. And I am actually going to have my friend, Elisa Kaplan, the Programming Vice President of the Jewish Historical Society, introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Okay. Hi, friends. I recognize a lot of people out there, and that's a good thing. Um, so my name is Elisa Kaplan, and along with my co-partner in crime, Marcy Schoenfeld, right over here, we're in charge of programming for the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. And it's such a beautiful summer day. Thank you for coming out. I hope you got to the beach or the golf course or the garden or something earlier today to be inside at this lovely time of day. Um, this is also a special week in the calendar. So let me be the, uh, the first or one of many. Um, if you're Jewish, happy Shavuot. Chag Sameach, good Yantif. Um, Tuesday night is the beginning of the holiday of Shavuot. If you're Christian or have Christian friends, um, we want to wish you um, a meaningful Pentecost Sunday, which is next Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday, as you know, marks the end of the Easter season and celebrates the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. So we have a sort of uh, spiritually heavy duty week, and we have a kind of heavy topic, but, but done in a super interesting and perhaps juicy way today. I want to thank Aaron Shea uh, the, and the staff of the Darien Library for providing this beautiful location and helping us with the program and the refreshments. Let's give her a big hand. And um, people say of Erin, Erin is our go-to person for adult programming at the library. She loves showing patrons how to check out e-books and use technology. So anybody here who wants to get to know Erin, she'd be a good friend. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce the president of the Jewish Historical Society for to bring greetings, Ava Weller. Ava? Hello everyone. It's certainly my pleasure to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County, as uh, Alyssa has. And I want to thank the uh, Darien Library for co-sponsoring today's program. Today we're actually making history because I believe this is the first time that we've ever had a program co-sponsored together here in Darien. So, um, can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I, I think it's a first, so we're making history. <laughs> uh, we're certainly happy to be here, and we thank you so much for, uh, for working with us on the program. I also want to thank the program uh, education VPs, Marcy and Alyssa, for coordinating yet another interesting and entertaining program, and also helping with the food and arrangements. Um, how many here are members of the JHS? Oh, a very good group. Thank you all for coming. I um, want to welcome those of you who are not members, and I hope you'll consider uh, joining our group. Um, some of you may not know that in the fall of 2014, it will be our 30th year, and this year, uh, the Bridgeport Jewish Historical Society is now part of the Jewish Historical Society of Fearful County. I hope you'll come and celebrate with us at a special event on September 14th. All are welcome if you're a member or not a member, but we'll, we would hope that you would like to join us as a member. Uh, please take a look at our membership brochure, and um, when you sign, I hope you've all signed in so that we can reach you, so that we can reach you either um, by snail mail or email. The Jewish Historical Society is only one of three Jewish historical societies in the state of Connecticut. 
we have the only Jewish archives in Fairfield County located at 990 Hope Street in Stanford, and we welcome donations of memorabilia, artifacts, and photographs. We also invite you to come and look at those memorabilia, artifacts, and photographs. We continue to collect stories and memories about local history through our oral history project, and we're now also recording Jewish veterans from all wars with the Veterans History Project connected to the National Archives. And you can see Alyssa or Marcy if, you're inter if you are a veteran and, you might, and you're interested in being um, interviewed. The JHS Lending Library is located at the Stanford, Stanford JCC with a wide selection of books for all ages and on Jewish topics and houses an extensive Holocaust collection. We now also offer DVDs on Jewish themes for all audiences. Uh, we also have a display case where we try to showcase some of the things from our uh, archives. JHS also holds monthly book talks, usually at the JCC and also out in the community, and, take, and makes available a traveling exhibit with photographs going back to the 1600s when Jews were first in this area. JHS also has materials to help you gather genealogical information about your families through its Heritage at Home program, and of course, we hold in other engaging programs on all topics uh, throughout the year. We really do have something for everyone. Alyssa now will introduce our speaker. We all look forward to a wonderful program. And I was going to say, thank you, I was going to say, thank you, Ava, and uh, we're glad you're okay. Okay. Um, as Ava mentioned, um, we have a few commercials before we get to our speaker, Edmund Levin. Um, this is our last program for the year. No book talks or programs during the summer, but we will see you in September, hopefully, at our 30th anniversary get-together party. Uh, and then our programming will start again after that. Um, a special announcement, please turn off cell phones, pagers, anything electric except for pacemakers. <laughs> That, that's our demographic. Um, okay. Before we get into the topic, let's see who's here. Let's tell our speaker who's here. Um, please raise your hand if you were born in any country that you consider to be Russia. You raise your hand if you, okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Please raise your hand if any member of your family, uh, siblings, mothers, fathers, grandparents, came from Russia. Okay. Okay. And please raise your hand if you have traveled to anything that could be considered Russia. All right. So. Okay, very good. Um, so now we know who we are. Let's find out who Edmund Levin is. Have you noticed that Russia is in the headlines? Uh, well, just on Friday, uh, U.S. News and World Report had an article about the dragon and bear inch closer. A natural gas deal enhances the strategic partnership between Russia and China. And the New York Times had presidents of Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus formally sign agreement long pursued by President Vladimir V. Putin to create limited economic union even as alliance is weakened by absence of Ukraine and its pale counterpart to European Union. The New York Times, pays, Times seems to pay by the word. Okay, and not to be outdone, Fox News says, uh, had this a headline, Russia pulls most troops from Ukraine border, Pentagon says. Okay, so Russia is definitely in the news in 2014. But what about the summer of 1911? We, if we had picked up a newspaper, we might have read the following. Um, Russian police have arrested Mendel Bayless, a 37-year-old father of five who works as a clerk in a brick factory nearby. He has been charged not only with the boy's killing, but with the Jewish ritual murder of this Christian child. What? Edmund Levin, you're gonna have to tell us what this means. We need some help to unpack this headline. 
luckily, you're here just to do that, and we're delighted to welcome you as our speaker today. Edmund Levin is the author of A Child of Christian Blood, Murder and Conspiracy in Tsarist Russia, The Bayless Blood Libel. And I want to know how you came up with that title and what you refer to it in short. Okay. That's the first one. Okay. A Child of Christian Blood. Okay, Edmund Levin is a Writers Guild, an Emmy Award winning writer and producer for Good Morning America. I asked him earlier if he had to leave to get up at 3 a.m. He said no. Okay, so we're lucky we could even ask him a few questions, I bet. Um, Edmund Levin's writing has appeared in a lot of important places. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New Republic, the Atlantic, and Slate, among others. Um, his writing was included in the Best of Slate 10th Anniversary Anthology. He studied Soviet and Russian affairs at Columbia University's Harriman Institute and has traveled widely in the former Soviet Union. According to Jonathan Yardley of the Washington Post, uh, thorough, lucid, and on all counts admirable, a Child of Christian Blood was researched almost entirely from primary sources by Levin, and he has done a superb job. This may well be the definitive book on its subject, and it's hoped that it finds a wide readership. Well, Edmund Levin, you have a wide audience today, and we look forward to what you have to say. Welcome. tread very carefully here. <laughs> I know that accidents have been known to happen. Um, let me get myself set up. Um, where'd that little thingy go? The, the, ah, uh, there it is. I've never, wait, there it is. I've never had such a high tech thing. For you, I have to press the button. I won't have to overwork my finger. Um, well, Alyssa, I want to thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and I want to thank the library and the, uh, <coughs> Uh, Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County for inviting me here, and thank you all for showing up, uh, uh, as Alyssa or Ava said, on such a beautiful day. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the beautiful day, and uh, uh, now uh, I appreciate you giving me a chance to tell this, uh, talk about this, this amazing story. It was, I think it's an amazing story. Uh, okay, I'm going to try to put my papers here. Um, you know, I was curious, and I, I always ask people this, you know, you know, I know a lot of you have Russian background or maybe even some people from Russia. Um, I was curious, how many of you, before you got the email blast or saw this card or however they contacted you, how many of you had heard of, of the Bayless case, Mendel Bayless? Okay, well, that, that, that's, that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good number, but a lot of you don't. There's no reason to be embarrassed because the... Bayless case has been uh, forgotten, but a uh, hundred years ago, as um, uh, Alyssa was saying, you, if you had seen the, you know, the head, you would have seen the headlines in those days. If I had asked you, have you heard of Mendel Bayless? A hundred years ago would have been, well, would have been this, the, the late spring of 1914. Uh, even then, um, if I had asked you, have you heard of Mendel Bayless? You would have said, are you crazy? Of course I've heard of Mendel Bayless. You know, where have you been? Have you been under a rock? You know, he was Mendel Bayless a hundred years ago was one of the most famous people on the planet. Everybody uh, knew who he was. Uh, and uh, the, the case, though, has been forgotten. Um, often people ask me how I came to write the book. Uh, like a lot of you, I have a Russian Jewish background. Um, and I first heard about the case from my grandmother, Bluma, Grandma Bluma. Uh, around the dinner table, she would tell stories about Tsarist Russia. Uh, I'm sure an experience probably a lot of you can, can relate to. Um, she grew up at the turn of the 20, late, late 1890s, uh, turn of the 20th century. Um, and I remember she would talk, tell stories about Tsarist Russia, and then you know, she, I remember she mentioned one that, and she said, no, and Mendel Bayless, with a kind of look in her eye, as if it kind of summed it all up, what it was like to grow up. Um, there, you know, a Jew accused of, of you know, uh, killing a child for his, for his blood. Um, that kind of summed it all up. Um, so I thought in the next few minutes uh, I'd talk about uh, how I came to write the book, I mean, how the case came uh, to be, uh, why uh, it was important, why I think it's persisted in its importance, why it's important 
to remember uh, today. So let me um, begin at the beginning. Um, uh, March 20th, 1911. Uh, and it began here, in a cave in Kiev. Uh, on the outskirts of Kiev, much in the news lately, uh, there were caves, uh, maybe still are. Uh, I wasn't able to get to them when I visited there. But uh, in this cave, uh, there were a couple of boys, uh, 12 or 13 years old, on kind of an adventurous jaunt, uh, looking for treasure, thinking, you know, imagined buried treasure in caves. And uh, one of the boys went in and he found uh, the body of a boy. Uh, Andrei uh, Yushinsky was his name. And I think it's always important to remember the victim's name, uh, the victims in this story, because in every blood libel case, there is a victim, although there are a few cases where there was no victim and they kind of made, a, made up a victim. But in most cases, there were actual children who were killed. And their, their killers went free because a Jew was, was wrongly accused. So I, I always like to you know, make that point. Um, so the boy's name was Andrei Yushinsky. And this picture is a little bit graphic. There's only, uh, unfortunately, there's only an autopsy picture of him. And they found a boy, this boy, uh, horribly uh, murdered. And um, uh, it's not gratuitous to show this, because there was a lot of talk about the number of wounds on the boy about the, by the anti-Semites, about the Kabbalistic significance, supposedly, of the number of wounds, which uh, some people said was 13 on, on the side of his head, but although it was actually probably 14. Um, but his body, whole body, was, was covered with wounds. Um, and uh, this is his uh, bloody shirt. He was on his way. He was uh, uh, studying to be a priest. He was on his way to, he, he had played hooky that day, uh, the day he was killed, um, and uh, was waylaid by someone. Um, and uh, uh, there's some arguing about who actually committed the crime. That's the front of his shirt, the back of his shirt. Uh, and here he is uh, in, his, in his coffin. Um, so uh, Andre was killed, and uh, immediately the, the hue and cry went up, and there was a, a movement in Russia at that time called the Black Hundreds. The Black Hundreds, uh, and there are Latter-day Black Hundreds in the Soviet Union and, and, and Ukraine, unfortunately, but then the Black Hundreds were a right-wing anti-Semitic movement that was quite uh, widespread. And the hue and cry went up that um, Andre had been killed by uh, the Jews. And uh, there is a, here, here's how his, Andre's, that picture is being used in anti Semitic propaganda. Um, and it says here, you can all hear me, uh, it says, uh, Christians guard the children. Uh, this is actually the next year, the 17th of March, uh, the 17th of March, excuse me, Yid Pesach begins. Um, so his, body was used, an image were used as, uh, as propaganda, even though uh, it's interesting, uh, one of the interesting aspects of this, this book has so many interesting aspects, the story, uh, you learn about the life at the, the time. I mean, Andrei Yuzhinsky had Jewish friends. So, you know, this, he was not an anti-Semite, he had Jewish friends, and his, nor were his uh, parents uh, anti-Semites. Um, so, um, you know, things are always a little more complicated than sometimes uh, we, we think. Um, I also thought maybe I'd say a little bit about the blood libel. Uh, probably you have a general idea of what it was. It originated uh, in the 12th century, 12th and 13th centuries. Actually, the first accusation of ritual murder, kind of the, the, the modern blood libel was, uh, you can call it that, uh, the modern version that um, uh, became perpetuated was uh, in, in, in England. Um, and then it developed over a couple of centuries uh, into the idea that uh, Jews uh, kill Christian children to obtain blood to make matzah. Uh, there are a number of versions. There's a Purim version. There's a Hamantaschen version. Uh, uh, but the, the, this version that was, that was propagated, that was uh, uh, the subject of this case of the murder of Andrei Yashinsky, this was the standard matzah version. Uh, and um, so to return to the case, uh, uh, the boy is found murdered. Uh, the Black Hundreds agitate. Uh, and the problem, uh, the, the, uh, and at some point, the regime, the Tsar's regime, Nicholas II was the Tsar at the time, uh, the regime decided to charge a Jew with the crime. Uh, that took a few months to do. Uh, the problem was finding a Jew to charge. Uh, and the man they chose was Mendel Bayless, um, a good, hardworking, a uh, family man, uh, and uh, let me talk a little bit about Mendel Bayless. He was a clerk in a brick factory, and it's a little kind of interesting. His story is interesting. It sheds light on Jews 
uh, the nature of their relationship to being Russian, uh, uh, of being a Jew in Russia, of being a Russian Jew. The actual term Russian Jew only came into, ter into uh, use in the mid to late 19th century. The idea that you could be Russian and Jewish at the same time. Uh, and and Mendel Bayles was very much a Russian Jew. He uh, was uh, born outside of Kiev. He came to Kiev with his wife and children to make a better life for himself. Um, and it's interesting where he worked. The brick factory uh, was owned by a rich Jew named Jonas Eitzev, and there were very rich Jews. He was a sugar beet magnate. Uh, uh, Kiev was something of a beet boom town. Um, people, they grew beets, they, they shipped beets, they, uh, there were sugar backed, beet sugar backed securities. It was all based on beets, um, the whole uh, the commerce. Um, so, uh, Bayless worked in a brick factory, but it wasn't an ordinary brick factory. He was the clerk and dispatcher. Um, and the proceeds went to support a uh, hospital, a charitable hospital founded by Zaitsev uh, that was open to people of all faiths. And the hospital was, uh, this, uh, was, was um, uh, founded in the 1890s in honor of the marriage of Nicholas and Alexander. Because the idea was, Zaitsev's idea and the idea that other Jewish grandees of the time was, we're going to show that we are loyal Russian Jews. We support the regime. We are doing our part. So in a way, Mendel Bayless, uh, working in the brick factory, um, he was doing his part to show that uh, Jews were good, loyal uh, subjects. Um, and, and for his uh, trouble, uh, for his hardworking nature, uh, he was, and there he is with his family, his uh, uh, five children. Uh, he was arrested, uh, dragged out of his home in the middle of the night. Uh, there he is, uh, actually this is uh, in 1913 when he actually got the indictment. The rolled up indictment is in his hand. Uh, and for his trouble, he was uh, thrown in jail for two and a half years, uh, awaiting a trial on this uh, insane uh, charge. Um, now, you know, you might I'm mean, asking now, you know, how did this case uh, happen? And I should say it became a worldwide call to celeb. There was a very big reaction uh, in the West um, condemning uh, the Tsarist regime. Um, this was not good for the regime's self-image. Um, and you know, you might think to yourself, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think that to understand the case, and if you know something about Russia, uh, Russia at the time, uh, this sort of end stage Tsarist Russia, uh, you kind of have to kind of maybe forget a little bit about what you think you know, I think, uh, and recover your sense of, of surprise. Because uh, you might think, well, Tsarist Russia, Nicholas II, pogroms, you know, they're all just a bunch of anti-Semites, so really you would expect this kind of thing. Well, that's really not the case. Um, people were shocked. The most violent opponents of the regime were shocked that uh, the Tsarist regime, as bad as it was, uh, would charge um, a Jewish man uh, with this crazy uh, medieval uh, charge. Um, and uh, um, people at the time, you know, they, uh, this was a time when, you know, this was whatever, five or six years before the regime disappeared, uh, was, you know, thrown on the dustbin of history. And people at the time, uh, in 1911, 12, 13, uh, progressives, conservatives, radicals, they all felt that something bad was going to happen. Uh, they felt that uh, the common metaphor of the time was that uh, Russia was living on the edge of a volcano. And especially for progressives at the time, people opposed the regime, they saw this, the Bayless case, as another sign that uh, this regime was, was doomed, that there was something horribly wrong. Um, uh, and the regime, you know, the, the regime, Nicholas II, his ministers, they also felt that, um, uh, had a premonition that something bad was going to happen. They were very intent on preserving order. Um, and uh, uh, the reason why the Bayless case is so strange in a way is that at, at this time, actually, the regime was trying to tamp down anti-Semitic violence. They were not encouraging violence against Jews. So what's somewhat mysterious is that um, while they were trying to keep control, keep order, uh, not allow pogroms, uh, they decide to, uh, with the full backing of the regime, foment this case that could only rouse the rabble. Um, and I, uh, 
you know, I, I think that the, the, the main reason, I believe, that behind this case, I, I cannot prove it, but uh, there is some evidence to suggest that, uh, you know, that I think that Nicholas II, uh, who was even more anti-Semitic than his ministers, uh, run of the mill officials, I think that his ministers believed that this case would please him because it went so counter to what they, the other things they were doing to keep the regime, preserve the stability of the regime, that I believe that their main motivation was to please uh, this man um, there with his five children. Uh, very much like Bayless, he has five children. And sometimes, let me point out to me, it's interesting to kind of, uh, the counterpoint is interesting, and their contrasting fates are kind of interesting. There's Bayless and his wife with their five children, and there's Nicholas II with his five children. In some ways, Bayless, I would say, well, Bayless ended up a luckier man. Uh, not in some ways, he, I think, I believe he, he did. Um, so Bayless is indicted. Uh, there's a shockwave from this case uh, across Russia, around the world. And you know, in Russia, I mean, the case was seen important in Russia and uh, in the West. Uh, in Russia, the case was seen as tremendously important. Uh, that, uh, in a sense, you know, the whole honor of the society was, was at stake. Uh, was this a civilized country? Was it a barbaric country? Um, in Western Europe, a large movement in defense of Bayless got off the ground pretty quickly. People like Arthur Conan Doyle, Thomas Mann, the Archbishop of Canterbury, signed petitions uh, in defense of Bayless. There were demonstrations um, uh, in, in his support uh, throughout 19, 1912. Um, so uh, uh, he got a lot of support quickly in Western Europe. Now, what about the American uh, uh, reaction, you may wonder? Well, the American reaction was interesting. Um, this is before the era of the, you know, what people have called the Jewish lobby, you know. <laughs> uh, it it, it uh, was, uh, you know, kind of a, a fraught term. Um, but uh, Jews were very uh, wary of being active politically. Um, there were a handful of congressmen in, uh, who were, uh, uh, you know, in, in, who were served in Washington at that time. Uh, the the uh, Jewish community was pretty slow in uh, coming to, uh, or Jewish leaders were coming to the defense of Bayless. Uh, and uh, there was come qu quite a bit of complaining that the Jewish leadership was slow off the mark in coming to his uh, defense. Uh, but they, uh, and I think it's a theme of Jewish history, especially modern Jewish history starting in the you know, mid-late 19th century, when Jews became kind of part of the broader society. Um, there was always hesitance to come up to speak out in favor of a fellow Jew when a Jew was in trouble, because you're worried, am I going to hurt this person more than I'll help him? Uh, it actually came up even, uh, if you look in, a, in the histories, uh, with Leo Frank, who was accused of uh, uh, killing a, a young woman in 1913 as well, uh, in Georgia. Um, uh, in a very great hesitance uh, about the Jewish leadership, you know, what are we going to do uh, if we speak up? Are we going to hurt this person? Are we going to hurt us? Uh, you know, are we going to hurt us when people call us disloyal Americans when we, if we speak up in, 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 in favor of, of, uh, of a foreign Jew? Um, but toward the end of the, uh, of the trial, and there's, uh, there's the courthouse there in Kiev, um, St. Sophia Square. Uh, it looks very much as it did 100 years ago. Uh, toward the end of the trial, there were uh, massive uh, demonstrations uh, in, uh, in the United States. There was, there was particularly one in Chicago, uh, headlined by uh, Jane Addams and Booker T. Washington. Uh, many well-known people of the day, thousands of people showed up of all different faiths, uh, ethnicities and quite a you know when I read it, I was quite moved uh, by articles in the Chicago Tribune about this kind of amazing forgotten uh, demonstration of you know solidarity of different ethnic groups of different religions uh, on behalf of this obviously person they they didn't know. Um, so now what about the trial? Let me look here. Um, the trial was crazy. It was hard to write about because it was so crazy. Uh, and it's hard to talk about in the brief span of time I have have here. Um, uh, I'll, but I, I, I've been fortunate to get a lot of good reviews, but I'll read you one critical comment I got. I wrote an article in, uh, in uh, Slate, and I uh, uh, 
sort of summed up the case. I want to get, get some water. Um, um, I wrote an article in, in Slate uh, kind of summing up the case. And uh, there was one kind of skeptical comment, which I'll read to you. And I think there's a lot to it. Uh, this person's, I can't say her, I can't say her, but uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't know, I think it was a woman, but Cherry is the name, could be a man, I suppose. Uh, and uh, Cherry says, I have no information about this case apart from this one story, but your over-the-top description of the witnesses against Bayless set off my, I'll put, let's say, nonsense detector, except she didn't use the word nonsense. If the witnesses against him were all notorious criminals, drunks and lunatics, no one would have paid attention to them at the trot. Okay, that is a really good description of the trot. Better than I had come up with. Notorious criminals, drunks, and lunatics. And I think that uh, the Bayless case stands out in the history of the blood libel for the it's completely unconvincing case, the completely unconvincing case the prosecution made. Uh, if you look at medieval cases, it isn't that you believe them, but there's kind of a um, there's kind of a persuasiveness. They 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 have their, all the testimonies from people who were tortured, uh, but it's horrifying. But you can see they're trying to craft a narrative that makes some sense, uh, at least you know, uh, at least uh, you know, to the people who you know to, to the audience they were directing uh, the accusation at. In this case, it the whole thing just didn't make make sense. Uh, let me talk about some of the witnesses. Um, uh, they had an eminent scientist, uh, Ivan Sikorsky. I don't have a picture of him. He was better, he's better known as the, the, his son, Igor Sikorsky, who invented the helicopter, is better known. Uh, Igor, but uh, Ivan Sikorsky was a uh, quite eminent scientist, but also uh, uh, a, a, an absolute you know, racial anti Semite a late blooming anti Semite. Um, and he acted as kind of a psychological profiler. And he testified uh, that uh, uh, the crime against Andrei Yashinsky was, as he said, typical of the vendetta of the sons of Jacob, meaning Jews. Uh, Sikorsky was also quite senile at the time, uh, ill, and uh, kind of was, was incoherent for quite a bit of the time on the stand. Um, then you had drunks. Real drunks, people who really people who could barely find their way to the witness stand, and it was a stand like this. You couldn't, you didn't sit. You had to stand, and these people could barely stand. Uh, there was uh, someone who was bribed, a pathologist who was bribed with four thousand rubles from Nicholas's Nicholas II's secret fund, slush fund, kind of you could call it, one million ruble fund. They called it. Uh, there was an expert on Judaism, so-called, the only expert the prosecution had, was a Catholic priest. Uh, but he was also a sometime con man. He was nearly arrested for art fraud, uh, somehow escaped punishment. Uh, and then, you know, if you sum up the, the wild nature of the case, um, there's Bayless under, under guard going into the courtroom. This is Vera Chibriak. Uh, she is the absolute most kind of seductive villain uh, you could find. Um, she was the uh, she was a criminal gang leader. Um, uh, she um, had uh, blinded her French lover with sulfuric acid a few years before, and somehow escaped punishment. Stuff really you can't make up. Um, and uh, she was really a full blown criminal sociopath. Uh, she was also the most likely person behind. Uh, Andre's murder, and uh, and she ended up as the star witness uh, for the prosecution. Uh, so, the, when 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 you know it, the sensational nature of the case, I think, speaks to the state of the regime. When the state has to cons conspire with a criminal sociopath, you know, you know something is wrong. You know, uh, something is wrong. Um, um, but luckily, Bayless had on his side, he had many good people. And I think if you added up the number of pe good people and bad people in the book, I haven't done it, but uh, I think probably more good people than, than bad. Um, one of them was uh, Nikolai Krasovsky in the center there, who was known as uh, Russia's Sherlock Holmes. And he tried to uh, prove Bayless uh, innocent. Uh, so he had 
uh, this man on his side. And uh, he had a, uh, an excellent uh, defense team, um, uh, uh, kind of the most well-known attorneys of the day. The man who's second from uh, the right is uh, Oscar Grusenberg, who was the leading defense, the Jewish uh, defense attorney of the day. The second from the left is Nikolai Karabchevsky. Uh, he was kind of, sometimes I've heard him later as the kind of the Clarence Darrow of Russia. Very eminent, eminent defense team. Uh, one, of his, one member of his defense team, not pictured here, uh, was a member of parliament. Uh, so he was very, um, uh, very well, had a very well defended. Now, how can I kind of briefly give you a sense of what the trial was, was like? And I'm just going to quote one piece of evidence that was presented. Um, uh, not evidence, but kind of a document that was read into the record. Uh, so uh, before uh, this uh, pseudo, total pseudo expert on Judaism, whose name was Father Justin Pernitus, before he testified, the prosecution read, had read into the record something called the Book of the Monk Neophyte. Uh, now, I should tell you there was extensive testimony on religion uh, there are all, all kinds of book, many, many books put into evidence. There is a whole pile. Uh, uh, some of them were pseudo, some of them were things like the Talmud, and some were pseudo scholarly works uh, that had absolutely no value at, at all. Um, and uh, so, when court uh, was in session, there's uh, there's the courtroom. You can see the witnesses face had their backs facing you. Uh, so when court was in session. Uh, uh, when they started the testimony on religion, uh, they read, uh, I said, this book called this uh, book called the Book of the Monk Neophyte, which I doubt any of you heard about in Hebrew school. Uh, it's not well known. Um, it is uh, of dubious authenticity. It was supposedly written by a Romanian Jewish convert to Christianity who became a monk, and I guess his uh, his name was Neophyte. Uh, that's the name he, he took. We don't know what his name, real name was, or even if he really existed. This is a text that emerged in the early 19th century. Uh, there's really no evidence that it's necessarily authentic uh, who this guy was, but the prosecution, and I guess this uh, expert on Judaism, he wanted it read into the record uh, because they thought it was valuable. Uh, so uh, Neophyte is talking about a curse on the Jewish people. Um, and uh, I'll just read you a little bit. Uh, the, the, the Lord will strike you, the, the Jews were eternally cursed. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt. And I'm sorry, there are some graphic anatomical terms. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt in the buttocks and the horrible scab and itch from which you will not heal. And some of these are derived from some biblical verses, if some of you are, are alerted in that. We clearly see that the damnation has been fulfilled, since all European Jews, I don't know if there are any European Jews here, have a scab on the buttocks. All Asian ones have mange on the head. Okay, and this is, this is something that the prosecution asked to read in the record. I mean, this is, you know, the top prosecutor in Kiev who was appointed by a minister in, uh, in St. Petersburg, uh, you know, one of the top ministers. Uh, all Asian ones have a mange on the head. All African ones have boils on the legs. And the Americans, here's where some of you come, have a disease of the eyes that is suffer from trachoma, as a result of which they are ugly and stupid. <laughs> the wicked rabbis found a medicinal remedy that consists of curing the afflicted with Christian blood. Um, so, you know, you're laughing, but it's, it's uh, pretty horrifying. This is read into the, uh, into the record. Um, and uh, uh, one of Bale's attorneys, I think one of the most brilliant attorneys, maybe the most brilliant attorneys, his name was Vasily Makakov. He, Maklakov, he was a parliament member. And he just didn't know what to say. This is a guy who spoke in paragraphs. You know, he knew that he knew, they had, I should say that the Russian justice system was pretty good. You know, for a normal case, it had discovery procedures, it had evidence, it had a judge who would listen to objections, I and mean, it was relatively ob observed Western standards. Uh, and Michael Cope just didn't know what to say. He said, all he could say was, you call this evidence? 
and he, then he sat down. He had no idea what to say. Um, so uh, to return to the trial, I mean, Russia had a jury system. Um, there is the jury, largely peasant jury, and you can tell them by their caftans and bowl haircuts that half of them were peasants. Uh, you know, there was really no real evidence against Bayless. Uh, the only reason he was charged was he, was he was the closest person living to the scene of the crime. The, I like to say this, that the cave was a few hundred yards, several hundred yards away from the brick factory. So that was really the only reason he was picked. Um, and people were concerned uh, that uh, ignorant peasants could be uh, manipulated. Um, and uh, uh, so, and, and, and indeed, I think the prosecution, but on the, the prosecution on their hand, displayed, displayed quite a bit of, of uh, paranoia uh, about Jewish power, even though Mendel Bayless was, as a Jew, was dragged from his home. Um, and uh, indeed, at that time, Jews were under hundreds of uh, uh, repressive regulations in the Pale of Settlement. They only lived in the 15 western provinces. Uh, Bayless lived in Kiev. You couldn't, a Jew could not live in Kiev. Uh, without permission, special permission. He, uh, Bayless got special permission to live there through the rich uh, uh, owner of the brick factory, Zaitsev. Um, so even though the Jews were so oppressed, um, the prosecution displayed great paranoia about Jewish power. And uh, this is the second quote I'll read from the trial. Uh, the prosecutor's name was Oscar Vipper. And uh, he told the jury in his summation, because he, he wanted them to understand how powerful Jews really were. He said, I will say candidly, let people criticize me if they wish, that I personally feel that I am in the power of the Jews, in the power of Jewish opinion, in the power of the Jewish press. And I should say at that time, Jews really controlled none of the press uh, at all. There was no factual basis for that. In fact, they rule our world. We feel ourselves under their yoke. And I think that he may have really believed this. In, on, on some level, I don't, you know, I, I don't necessarily think he said something he didn't believe. I think that he believed that. Um, well, uh, despite the loony testimony, um, there was a lot of concern that Bales would be convicted because these were peasants. Uh, and um, it's interesting how people's memories betray them. Uh, Oscar Grusenberg, who was Bales' attorney, was quite a Russophile. Interestingly enough, he felt very Russian, a Russian Jew, felt very much a Russian Jew, maybe more Russian than Jewish. And he wrote in his memoirs two decades later that he had no doubt that Bayless would be acquitted because no jury of good Russians uh, would, would, uh, would convict him. And it tells you something, I think, about, uh, again, I said you learn from the characters in this story uh, different aspects of the Russian and Jewish experience. But Bay uh, Grusenberg was a very Russian man culturally. I've had a great attachment to the Russian people, and there were a lot of Jews like that, upper class Jews, well off Jews, uh, Jews in the professions who felt that way. And he said, no, no, no Russian jury would possibly convict him to convict Bayless. Well, I found an interview the day after the trial ended, and he told the reporter uh, that after the judges charged the jury, which was quite prejudiced, he said, I was sure Bayless was lost. I had no doubt that he would be convicted. Um, well, um, Bayless, uh, I don't know if you, how many of you know how the story ended. Um, I'd like to leave you just to leave it hanging there, leave a cliffhanger. But uh, Bayless was acquitted, although there were uh, uh, some interesting wrinkles that maybe I'll get into in the question and answer section. Se session. He was uh, acquitted, although the jury was seen as sending a message that uh, the blood libel um, uh, was indeed true. Um, there was a sort of notorious double verdict, uh, which uh, maybe we can talk to talk about about later. Um, uh, and um, uh, Bayless uh, uh, told a reporter, uh, you know, I think also should talk a little bit about Bayless. Um, he uh, uh, acted with great courage uh, in prison. Um, he was an ordinary man. Um, but I think he found something in himself, found courage in himself that he didn't know he had. Um, and at the end, after the end of the trial, a, a reporter asked him, um, uh, what are you going to do now? And he said, I'd love to take a rest. I'd love to go somewhere, but I'm going to stay in Kiev because I want to show the black hundreds that I'm not afraid. Uh, and he did stay there uh, for a few weeks, but eventually decided it was too dangerous, uh, too dangerous to stay there and, uh, and emigrated uh, to uh, Palestine and then 
uh, to, to the United States uh, with, with his family. Um, blood, blood libel, a little bit of blood libel today, it's uh, still around. Um, uh, there are people who believe in it. Uh, it's quite prevalent in the Middle East. You only have to Google things and you'll, you'll find it. Um, and um, uh, it's also uh, it's also still believed by some people uh, in, in 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 Europe in so-called civilized countries. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Andre. It's interesting. I have a picture of Andre's grave here, um, which you know is in Kiev. And Kiev is a little bit in the news, uh, as you know. Uh, if you went to Andre's grave at this time of year. Uh, you would find, find uh, fresh flowers on it. Uh, because uh, people who believe in the blood libel, uh, it is a place of pilgrimage for them. Uh, and uh, I think that's something, uh, when I went, I took this picture myself, um, that's something that really made me, made me angry, um, sad, because uh, Andrei Yushinsky, who had Jewish friends, uh, he would not have liked that. Uh, so in a way, his, his grave, which, uh, which was renovated by uh, right-wing people, um, it stands out in this cemetery as one of the better tended graves, a very well tended grave. Um, he would not have, have wanted that, but unfortunately it does stand as testimony to uh, the persistence of the blood libel uh, into our time. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you. in Slovakia in the early 1900, where they accused uh, a Jewish man, I don't remember. Right, the Rudolf Pilsner. Yes, and uh, uh, Tomasz Garek Masaryk yeah. defended him, and he came and he became. Yeah, that's that's true. That was another uh, case, and actually, that's I'll go to the podium here. Uh, you bring up an interesting point. There were in the late 19th century. This was, I should say, it's a really important point. This is not. I mean, the blood libel is a Western. Uh, invention. It, it arose in the West. And indeed, in the late 19th century, there was a wave of blood libel cases, blood libel cases, and if there were uh, uh, accusations, cases that got a lot of attention. And uh, there were about a half dozen trials. And indeed, one of them was in, uh, in what is now in, in Bohemia, I believe, of a man named Rudolf Hilsner. Yeah. You may be right, maybe your geography, I thought it was Bohemia, but maybe it's Slovakia. Uh, there were also cases, a case in, in Hungary, in, uh, I don't know if there are any Hungarians here, I may be probably mispronouncing it, Tisa Eslar. Tisa Eslar. Very, thank you, Tisa Eslar. Uh, there was a case in, uh, in uh, Kurnitz, uh, in what was then Prussia. There were a few cases, and in a way, the Russians were just imitating the West. And indeed, the prosecutor, in his summation, he said, you know, and he had, well, one of the valid points he made uh, was that, uh, look, you know, you're accusing us of, of of fomenting this case, but you know you've had your cases too, and indeed this comes from from you. Yeah. The, the, book, the oh, Protocols yeah. of Zion. Um, That's also something promulgated by the church. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the the Protocols of the Elder Zion, the the origins of the protocols are obscure. Uh, it used to be said that it was the Russian uh, secret police that uh, uh, drafted them and uh, promulgated them. The now recent scholarship has cast some doubt on that. Um, it seems like there's no doubt that it arose in Russia, although from Western sources. Um, but it actually, during, uh, I'll just say during the Bales case, it really played no role. It only became, while it was written before the Bales case, uh, it only gained wide currency uh, after the Russian Revolution. Yeah. I guess I have two questions. Okay. One is, how did you have access to all the documents? I assume you have read Russian. I do. Um, and the second question is that you said something about that woman, uh, the, the gangster woman. Yeah, Vera. In terms of maybe yeah. she being wild, can yeah. you just expand on that? Okay, well, about, about sources. Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, the archives became much more accessible. Um, the uh, state archive uh, in Kiev put out thousands of documents on microphone about the Bills case, and I was able to get access to a lot more documents um, uh, in, 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 in Kiev. So they just put that on, they're on microphone wheel, reels, they're in libraries. Um, and I also went to Kiev and did research in the library there. Um, and about Vera Chibriak, um, yeah, her, her son was best friends with Andrei Yashinsky, and the leading theory is that um, uh, Andrei may have seen too much 
and was uh, uh, was killed because they wanted to silence him. That's when the theory. Yeah. Did the uh, Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox Church, have any influence one way or the other uh, on this particular incident? Uh, the Russian Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox Church was not terribly active in this case. There were some Orthodox. Uh, people who came out, Orthodox clergymen who came out against the case. Um, in general, the, the Orthodox Church was very subservient to the state and was not very politically active. So I think the Bayless case was really mainly a political phenomenon, not a religious one. But there were certainly, in, in the um, uh, you know, religious journals, especially after the case, there were a number of, uh, quite a bit written about the case uh, that, you know, where people believed that, yes, he did commit this crime. But they, in terms of a propaganda way, we weren't that active. Yeah. Two questions. How old was the young man who was killed, and did they ever find out who killed him? Well, he was 13 years old, and uh, after um, uh, they, you know, they did not investigate the case uh, after Bayless was was acquitted. Yeah. In this country, there was a case in 1928 in the state of New York, but it was, the child was found, so she was she was lost in the woods. And uh, the rumor went around that the Jews, it was just before the holidays, that the Jews used her blood for their rituals. And they took the rabbi to the police station, questioned him. Uh, there was a big hue and cry about it. They, they called Rabbi uh, Wise, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, what happened was, of course, she walked out of the woods the next day and was found. And uh, they apologized, but they didn't make a, enough of an apology. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the Messina case, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with it. I'm not, I think you're more familiar with it than, than I am. Uh, but uh, that is the one kind of American yes. blood libel yes. case. But it didn't, you know, it didn't go too far, luckily. Yeah, but it was, it, 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 the, the Jewish community was yeah. right. Yeah, no, the, yes, I, um, yeah, that's absolutely true. So, you know, it isn't just Russia that where there's any semblance right. obviously. Yes? How was the defense financed? And in the pre-internet stage, how did it get so much international attention? Okay. Some story behind that. Um, let me take a water break. Um, the defense they, they, it was pro bono. The defense they volunteered uh, volunteered their uh, uh, their time, uh, which and a lot, was a lot of time. The trial was thirty four days, and there was a huge amount of preparation involved. Um, how did it become so big? Well, I think there are, uh, you know, they had newspapers and uh, stuff like that. The case had, I think there are two reasons uh, the case became so well known. It was why it was front page news around the world. Um, one is that the, the, you know, there was, in the West, there were um, Jewish leaders who drew attention to the case. Um, uh, in particular, in, uh, in England, there was, uh, a, uh, a Jewish activist journalist named Lucian Wolf, um, who uh, drew attention to the case, uh, got uh, petitions uh, organized and stuff like that. Also, the case was simply just, you know, from the standpoint of a journalist, I mean, it just made for fantastic copy. You know, it was a sensational case. I mean, someone like Vera Chibriot, you know, it's, uh, I think that's also one reason journalists, journalists were attracted to it. So journalists were attracted to it, and I think people who were, who were appalled by the case simply for what it was, uh, where, where uh, felt that something needed to be done. Yeah. Now, communism had started uh, fomenting in Russia at this time, and there were Jews involved in that. Was the Tsar against the Jews, and did he have something to do with this from a political standpoint? Well, I think that, um, I, you know, I believe the Tsar, uh, uh, I think his minute, the Tsar, his Tsar Nicholas was very innocent. For sure, uh, I think that the minister, his ministers, believed the case would please him. Uh, there's evidence that he followed the case very closely, uh, although there's no, you know, there's no document where he signs off on it. But uh, there's uh, uh, evidence that he followed the case very closely. Yeah. How and why did they settle on Bayless as the person um, to who committed the crime? There were a lot of Jews to choose from. Um, in some ways, he wasn't the best Jew because he was to choose, to choose because he was not terribly religious. You know, he uh, did not look. You know, he did not dress 
like a stereotypical Jew, um, and uh, I think the main reason, as I said, was that he was the closest guy I looked to the brick factor. Uh, but it was very hard to fit the case to him because he was so, um, you know, he was I said he was not religious, hardworking guy. He had served in the army. Uh, so the only reason was location, as I say in real estate, location, location, location. <laughs> it's the only reason they picked him, was that he lived at Community Arts in the Cave, I, as far as I can have been able to determine. Yeah? I was wondering, can you tell us something about this case in America a couple of years ago before Brady's case? It was Frank, your uh, friend, who was killed. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly no, I'm no expert in the Frank case. Actually, the, the Frank case actually occurred, was actually going on at the same time. The trial and everything was going on at the same time as the Bell's case, an amazing uh, coincidence. The Russian peasants were Jewish. I yes. protected this guy, but American people killed him. Uh, you know, no, the Frank case. The American Jewish people, you know, protest. Yeah, uh, the Frank case shows there's no, the Russians had no monopoly on anti Semitism. And the Frank case is fascinating and horrifying uh, in its own way and had a much worse end in a way. Uh, you could say in a way that you could argue that, that Frank got more, that the rather um, Bayless got more support in Russia than Frank did in the United States. You could, it's a, there would be an interesting uh, article about that. I mean, uh, but I'm no expert, I'm, I'm an expert on the case, but you could make that, that argument. I think you're right. Yeah. I have two questions. Yeah. One was the case dispatched quickly, in other words, with these, shall we say, trumped up charges, or did it drag out? I, I have no idea. Did it take a long time, or was it kind of? Uh, well, he was in jail for a long time. He was in, tri in jail from August, uh, July 1911 until the trial began in late September 1913. So he was in jail for over two years in horrible conditions. The trial was 34 days long, so it was a pretty long trial. Not like OJ, but not as long as that, but 34 days is pretty long. You know, it's and, what, and the second question was, and what was the impact of these popular figures, Thomas Mann and others, kind of Doyle, did they, did they play into it from the early start or when the trial came up? Um, you know, what was their impact? That's, a re that's an interesting question. I, I doubt for, for all their admirable activity, I doubt that it had any impact on, on, the, on the trial. But, um, and you could say maybe it didn't have any impact uh, in fighting anti-Semitism later, given what happened later in the, uh, in the 20th century. Um, so I would say, sadly, it perhaps did not have any impact. Uh, uh, yes. What was happening in the Jewish movement? Like people in newspapers at that time. Here, I mean, in, in New York, for example. In New, okay, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, there was a lot of uh, another question. What happened in the in the Jewish newspapers in in, in, in New York or you know generally? Um, um, you know, the case was written about. Interestingly, there was an enormous. The most coverage the Bayless case got was in the Yiddish theater. There were plays in the, you know, the Yiddish, the very active Yiddish theater on the Lower, Lower East Side, and there were plays with people playing Mendel Bayless during the trial. There were dancing Bayless's and singing Bayless's, and, and, it was, and, and, and these plays were condemned by uh, high-minded editorial writers in the Yiddish press. Um, uh, so, uh, I would say, and I say in the book, in a way, I think these the the the, 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 the sort of the they call it shund in Yiddish, I believe, the sort of low trash theater. Um, they um, uh, in a way that the, the Yiddish theater, for all its uh, kitschiness, was paying more attention to Bayless than anyone else. Um, and as I said, in America, they kind of caught on late uh, to what was going on in, in Russia. Okay. Uh, well, we are at the end of our time. But a very special thank you to Edmund Levin. Thank you. To Aaron Shea here at the Iberian Library. But wait, there's more. There's, uh, there's an ONIC. Um, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, you're cordially invited to talk to Edmund Levin. I talk to him directly, ask him questions one on one. His book is for sale, which I'm sure you'll be happy to sign, sure. and out in the lobby, and there's food. So please join us for, for conversation, food for thought, and food for your body and soul. And thank you, thank you. Oh, Aaron. I didn't have anything to say. Okay, thank you very much for coming, and see you in September.